identification on the video. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Dorothy Green, D-O-R-O-T-H-Y, and green just like the color. I'm president of the Los Angeles and San Gabriel Rivers Watershed Council. Great. I think the first question we'd like to ask has to do with the importance of water. As Steve was saying, a lot of people back east, and this is going to be a national video, really don't understand the implications of water, especially here in Southern California. Well, Southern California is a semi-arid region. We get on the average 15 inches of rain a year, and that's on average. And almost all of that is in the middle of the winter. And so to provide water, drinking water, for the 14 million people that live in Southern California, we have to import water from uh, hundreds of miles away. There are three major aqueducts that bring water into the Southern California region. Um, even so, with those three aqueducts, we still do depend for about a third of our water resources on what is here locally, on rain and what comes down off of our mountains into our local aquifers. Can you give me an idea of the Water Council's mission? Succinctly, I know it's a tough one. Uh, the Watershed Council was really formed to um, facilitate better communications between all the different kinds of water agencies. There are five different kinds of water agencies here. Um, people who manage our storm water, people who import water, people who uh, or agencies that um, manage the groundwater resources, other agencies that reclaim and so that we can reuse water, and then our water quality agencies. And there's been a history here, and I'm sure this is true all over the country, where these agencies were established with very narrow single purposes in mind, and it's not part of their mission to communicate or to plan in a coordinated, comprehensive way. And so that was really the, um, what was behind the formation of the Watershed Council. Though once we did form, of course, our mission broadened out to include all the stakeholders in the watershed, to include them in, in trying to come up with a way to use our resources as efficiently and effectively as possible to restore our rivers, to uh, restore habitat that's been so lost and so damaged. And also to use greening our rivers and, and improving the watershed as a way of stimulating economic redevelopment in some of the worn out parts of our cities. Uh, greening has been proven nationally over and over again to increase property values. And if we can do that, then perhaps people will want to um, rebuild um, and, and um, especially build new housing near the rivers and deal with this problem of urban sprawl that is plaguing so much of, of the country, and especially here in California. Yeah, great. Let me ask specifically about the Forest Service's role in all this. Mm -hmm. How do you see the Forest Service helping to fulfill the vision that you have? Well, Angeles National Forest was established very specifically to protect water supply here in the San Gabriel Valley. The San Gabriel Valley is a huge aquifer that is dependent on the rainfall in the mountains. It rains two, three times as heavily in the mountains as it does on the flatland. That's where the water comes from. And uh, it's critically important that we maintain our tree canopy, tree cover to retain that water and release it slowly in, into our rivers and streams and to protect the water quality. Forest Service has been an active um, participant? Yes, the Forest Service has been very actively involved since the foundation of the uh, Watershed Council. Played a very active role. Do you see a different role in the future than what, what they're currently doing, the Forest Service? Um, well, there's lots of roles that have been played. Um, I think initially it was um, helping us to understand the problems of managing the forest that has been very beneficial for me and I'm sure for other stakeholders in the organization. Uh, the role that fire must play in maintaining a healthy forest, um, that's been very valuable. Uh, the whole problem of the sediment that comes down off the forest that clogs our reservoirs that, that are needed for um, uh, so that we have where to put storm water so it doesn't overwhelm our storm channels. Uh, sedimentation is a big major problem that we continue to work with the Forest Service on. Um, and also um, 
Uh, Rundo, we have a, an exotic weed here that is very destructive in our local watershed called a Rundo Donax. And the Forest Service here has played a, a major leadership role in trying to organize eradication um, processes and, and um, you know, an, an Arundo Council, essentially, to try to eliminate this very devastating exotic weed. Hmm. Well, I didn't realize that. What would you say would be the biggest um, problem you face right now with what your, your organization is trying to do? What is the biggest hurdle? It's still cross-communications. It's, it's getting everybody to think in, um, along the same lines. Uh, we've published a, a vision statement that was adopted unanimously by our board, which represents a wide variety of stakeholders, as well as the oh, 50 or so people who show up at our stakeholder meetings every month. Um, and it's, it's a very broad vision that includes a lot of the ideas that um, uh, we talked about and, and even more. Uh, getting out and selling that so that people understand the synergies of working cooperatively, that when um, a project that can be supported by numerous agencies not only is a better project but you have more funding pots that you can dip into. Um, so there's, there's lots and lots of benefits of working toward multipurpose projects that um, everybody can support and uh, help to finance. Mike, you've mentioned the um, project. I don't know the name for it. Down there, the um town yards is I'm the sorry, one. I stopped this. I'll have to ask you to start over again. Okay. Can I stop the camera briefly? Okay. Okay. Papers rolling. The Chinatown Yards is an, a, a wonderful example of the synergies that can come from a multi-purpose project. This is probably the most broadly based. Well, it could tap into more pots of money than any other project imaginable. It would restore the original Zanja Madre, or mother ditch, that brought water from the Los Angeles River to what was the original Pueblo de Los Angeles. Um, we want, would restore that mother ditch to bring water to a, an old railroad marshalling yard that's now been abandoned and the railroad tracks have been pulled up. It's in kind of a natural bowl adjacent to Chinatown, just north of downtown Los Angeles. If we could bring water in there, develop a water feature, the land that would connect between that water feature and the river to make park, open space, a uh, detention basin for stormwater. Um, parts of downtown will flood in a 100-year storm. We need extra detention capability. So that land could be used for detention basins. It could be soccer fields when it's not raining, which is most of the time. Uh, Chinatown desperately needs a middle school. It could go there with the playground using part of this open space. Uh, Chinatown also is desperate for housing. There's a bluff overlooking this natural bowl that would be just ideal to put apartment, apartment buildings, uh, apartments cascading down this bluff. Um, so we've got historic preservation, housing, economic redevelopment, because around that water feature, we also see a tremendous redevelopment of, of uh, shops and, and uh, restaurants and services for the local folks. Um, habitat restoration, wetlands and riparian habitat where it goes near the river. Um, we could do all of those things and more with this kind of a project. That's great. It's fascinating. The Forest Service, do they have any particular role that they could play with, with, with this um, project? Or is it the Forest Service is also helping to really sponsor um, the creation of an urban forest. And the urban forestry part of the Forest Service mission, I think, would be very useful. In, um, in this kind of a redevelopment. Okay, good, good. Um, are there any other, you mentioned briefly sort of economic uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. um, are there other kinds of things that you see um, that could help the urban population with this kind of emphasis on, uh, uh, on the restoration? Yeah, I'd like to back up a little bit and, and talk some more about this, the role of an urban forest. Um, I mean, it's obvious that having more trees means that more water is retained on site. We've been spending a lot of time here at the Watershed Council uh, examining alternative ways of managing stormwater. 
so that we can, instead of throwing away what is a real resource, uh, to look at it as an asset, not as a liability. And in fact, we've got a book named that that's going to be off the presses, hopefully, the first of the year. Um, this booklet, um, three quarters, over three quarters of the rainstorms um, here at the Civic Center are an inch or less. There is no reason why we can't retain all of that water, all of those inch or less storms on site. Um, use that water to recharge the groundwater. Use the forest canopy of the city to help that, with that water. Uh, use mulch, chip up our green waste and put it right back on the land because mulch can absorb tremendous amounts of water, reduces weeds, uh, just increases the, the fertility of the soil um, reduces the heat island effect of the city, uh, decreases the need for air conditioning, improves air quality. I mean, you just go on and on and on. Doing this has just so many multiple benefits. And then we won't have to import as much water from 300 miles away, and we won't have to pump that water over mountain ranges to get it here. So we're saving energy and resources and not having such a detrimental effect on the places from which we take our drinking water supply at the present time. Yeah. That's just an ability for... For more, yes. There's no reason why we can't increase the amount of water that we use. I mean, that's one of our goals, is to use our water resources as efficiently as possible. And um, I'm now in the planning stages of doing a similar booklet that will um, lay out what the water resources are of just this region of LA County, showing how and examining what the potentials are for um, increasing um, our local supply, and starting with how we manage stormwater. Um, I've also started conversations with the Bureau of Reclamation to see if we can't get a study done that would quantify um, how much water would could we would we could we recharge and make available as drinking water supply if we were to retain all our three-quarter inch or one inch storms on site. Good. I think, you know, I think mm -hmm. that's like one of the main areas that you're looking at. Yeah. And specifically with the stormwater that falls on the Civic Center, the urban area, not the... Yeah, and even... Engage of downtown. That's, that was a yeah. Civic Center rain gauge that I was thinking of. Maybe we can... Um, okay. Uh, we're examining... Uh, we'd like to do a study that would quantify how much water really could be retained, could be, let's start over again. We're looking to see, uh, to be able to quantify, should we be able to retrofit the city to retain all of these one-inch storms on site, how much would that mean in terms of augmenting our drinking water supply? Uh, there's a group of agencies that already has been working with a local environmental group called Tree People to retrofit a house in South Central Los Angeles to retain more than a one-inch storm on site, a two-inch storm on site, by putting dry wells in the front yard, off the driveway, uh, capturing the water off the back half of the roof into a cistern where that water could be then used during dry periods to irrigate the landscaping. There are grassy swales in the backyard for just the, land, the water that falls on the land itself to go through the swale and then infiltrate into the ground. There are many such techniques. They're all of them quite simple and um, readily understood, and uh, everybody knows about them who's involved and interested in these things, and they're not that expensive to do. I mean, this house was retrofitted with everything possible one, one on, it cost $10,000 to do it. If we were to retrofit many houses with similar uh, installations, that price would come way, way down. And we would reduce the stormwater, the need to incre Im constantly increase the stormwater system, augment our drinking water supply, um, eliminate uh, garbage trucks carrying green waste to landfills, uh, the air pollution that goes with those trucks operating, and the tipping fees at the landfills to dispose of that green waste, which also is a valuable thing not to be thrown away, just as the water is valuable and should not be thrown away. Um, but historically, 
you know, our flood control districts were organized just to get rid of the water, to protect lives and property, and the, the way you move water out as quickly as possible is in a concrete channel. Uh, but now everybody's beginning to rethink that idea and realize that, yeah, you're getting rid of it as fast as possible, but you're also getting rid of something that's valuable and that should be uh, treasured. Let's talk about this. Or, um... Well, ideally, of course, you know, one of the goals that uh, is in our vision statement that seems extraordinarily unrealistic but yet is a goal and is part of our vision is to restore steelhead trout in our rivers. Uh, the L.A. and San Gabriel rivers used to be full of trout, and they cannot exist in a concrete channel. If we are able to reduce the amount of flow in those concrete channels significantly enough by doing all of these new on-site things, then perhaps we can jackhammer out some of that concrete. Because water does flow much more slowly and not as efficiently through a, a, a natural river. So we've got to deal with that water somewhere else, somehow else, if we're going to be able to really restore the river to look like a river. And besides, the floodplain's all been built on. I mean, that's, you know, you maximize property value. That's what Southern California's been all about. You maximize real estate values. And you do that by channelizing the, the rivers and the creeks so that you can build right up to their, to their banks. Are you working with uh, the uh, city engineers to um, look at future development, future um, housing projects with, in terms of the water capturing? Well, actually, County Public Works, which manages a lot of the storm drain system here in L.A. County, has, is, is struggling right now with a the problem. There's an area in the eastern San Fernando Valley, a little sub-watershed called Sun Valley, where they've had local flooding for 30 years. And County Public Works designed their s traditional concrete box channel, costed it out $42 million, and then said, hey, maybe if we spent that $42 million another way, uh, we could accomplish multiple benefits. And they are in the process right now of working with the local citizens, with the homeowner groups, with the local elected representatives, to explore all of these alternative ways of managing stormwater and to see um, if they can't be put into place as an alternative to that concrete box channel. Great. I still would like a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, as the city has grown over the years, we have paved over the landscape. As much as 80% of the land is now covered with buildings, roofs, roads, streets, parking lots. And as a result, the hydrology, the natural hydrology of the landscape has been changed dramatically. There's no room for the water to soak into the ground naturally. And this is what we're trying now to figure out ways to restore all over the watershed. Um, and to do that means to retain water on site using dry wells, using um, uh, permeable paving materials, uh, using um, mulch to cover areas that otherwise may be just open dirt so that the water can, can soak in, and looking at every other possible um, idea or way of doing that. Um, because that natural hydrology has got to be restored if we're going to be able to use our water resources the way nature intended them to be used. Uh, an old proverb that water is never valued until till there's a drought, until you run out, and then you realize how important water is. Um, here in this heavily urbanized area that we live in here in Los Angeles, water is critically important also because of its need in, in support of habitat. We have destroyed just about all of the natural habitat here in the Los Angeles area in our effort to get rid of water, to get rid of storm water. And as a result, people have to go up into the forest just to touch a, a, a real tree, any kind of natural environment. Uh, you just have to go into the Angeles National Forest on a weekend and you see how hungry people are 
for some contact with the natural world, um, it's overrun with people. Um, we've got to be able to figure out a way, again, of making that water available in places in the city where we have it. Okay. Um, people here in this urban environment have just totally lost contact with nature. Uh, everything is man-made. It is such a hardscape. The hunger for touching something that's real, if it's something natural, is so pervasive. Uh, you just have to go into the National Forest here on a weekend and see it's like wall-to-wall -wall people. You wonder how so many people can find a place to sit and picnic or, or just be in the natural environment. It's just critically important for our mental health. Um, so water is the, the critical element if we're going to really restore some of that habitat here within the city itself. And that, of course, is one of our goals also, is to bring back some habitat within the city so that people don't have to drive up into the forest. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the San Gabriel Mountains are among the youngest mountains in the country, and in rainstorms they come down. They, they're, uh, in fact, the San Gabriel Valley is like 20,000 feet deep of sediment that has washed down off those mountains that is now our Angeles National Forest. Uh, as a result, there's a huge aquifer at the foot of those mountains. All the water, the rainwater from those mountains go down into that sediment. And um, as a result, there are huge sand and gravel mining operations right at the base of the mountains that have been mining sand and gravel uh, hundreds of feet deep down below the surface of the groundwater so that you look into those huge gravel pits and you see a lake. And that lake is our groundwater supply that um, feeds over a million people. That's wonderful. Yep. That's great. Thank you. That one will show that. Thank you. Uh, the Olmsted brothers were visionary landscape architects who were invited into Los Angeles, oh, 70, 80 years ago to help the city develop a plan for what it should look like. And their plan included retaining all the rivers and streams with a natural band of uh, a green belt along all the natural rivers and streams of the area. Uh, the plan was put on a shelf and forgotten, unfortunately. It is now being revived. In fact, the Huntington Library will be republishing it this year. And um, the idea of a green belt from the mountains to the sea is something that everybody has just really bought into. The mayor and the railroad who owns the land yeah. is in escrow as we speak with Ed Roski, who is well, Phil Anschutz is major um, shareholder in Union Pacific Railroad. Mm -hmm. He and Ed Roski are partners in building the new basketball stadium, Staples Center. Mm -hmm. Anschutz has sold this cornfields, Chinatown uh, old rail yard to Ed Roski, his good buddy, for Tilt Up Industrial. And the mayor has helped them get some uh, urban redevelopment, some HUD money for, I forget under what, which program, um, because it's a poor in need of redevelopment stuff. So Two of the richest men in the world. So the big money will win out then? No, we're demanding an environmental impact report. Folar's, I should say, not, not this watershed council. I've got a board that refuses to be as activist as I would like, but hopefully we'll bring them along. <laughs> We're getting there slowly but surely. Um, yeah, they're planning a lawsuit if they don't do a full EIR. They were going to do it on a negative deck. So. Planning Commission, in fact, there was a meeting yesterday on this subject, is um, going to be taking a new look at the significant ecological areas, seas. That haven't really been studied for a long time. I don't know what they're going to do with it. Uh, but this meeting yesterday was called by Dan Silver from the Habitat League, Endangered Habitat League, uh, to see if we can't really beef up what they do do and uh, get some teeth into it. So, do you have some thoughts about that whole idea of the corridor? 
if it's not, that's fine. Um, it's just, it's going to be so hard in this urban area. I mean, all the land's been built on. There's such, and, and especially if there's going to be bike trails next to the river, which is part of the vision, and equestrian trails in some places, how much wildlife are you really going to wind up with? Um, uh, I, I wouldn't say apathy. I would say the lack of understanding by people in the community of what is possible and the also lack of appreciation of what was here before the city. We had one of the richest natural environments anywhere. The density of Indians living in the Southern California coastal plain was denser than anywhere else in the nation because the food supply was so incredibly rich. This was bear country, berry country, wild grape country, wetlands, huge wetlands. At, at one time, there was a wetland that extended all the way from Beverly Hills to Huntington Beach in Orange County. Uh, this was extraordinarily rich habitat uh, with incredible biodiversity incredible biodiversity that's been compared to the biodiversity of the uh, rainforest, the Amazon rainforest. Yeah. Certainly in terms of plant life. You've been involved for over 20 years. Can I ask why, why do you have this passion for this? What, what drove you to get involved? What drove me was depression. <laughs> My activism is an antidote to depression. Um, I just couldn't stand to see things getting worse and worse and worse and had to do something about it. And you've lived here in Mount Olive most of your life? Yeah, since I was 15. 15 years. Yeah. You know, I'm meeting people on this project because there's single people there. Um, Polk up industrial, but see, he doesn't want the bluffs, and that's that's the sticking point because you can't put industrial on 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 the bluffs on the on the. So he does like nine acres out of. Uh, the new county effort to re-examine the significant ecological area and the need for some legal advice was apparent and we'd like to be able to set up a conference call on um, Tuesday the uh, 14th at 9 o'clock if possible between you and Jan Chatton Brown and Joel Reynolds and uh, some of us who were at this meeting to see what the legal options might be for following up on uh, this endangered uh, the seas, the significant ecological area problem uh, within the county. So if you could get back to me ASAP, I'd really appreciate it so we could confirm this with everybody else. My phone number downtown is 213-367-4111. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? It's okay, you can talk to me. Yes. Okay. Um, did you get a chance to talk to Oli? 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 Um, no. Should I just go ahead and make the appointment for this one of the days? I left a message for him. Okay. On his voicemail, he wasn't there. Because yeah. if I don't... Uh, try calling again now, or I will. Try I'll call him right now. Okay. I'll and call him right now. No, just they, they just want to get by the big computer uh, oh, okay. which dates are best. For, Wednesday is best for him. Okay. And uh, uh, Wednesday the 17th is uh, our stakeholders meeting. So the previous, I think it was the 17th. Wednesday the 11th. Um, or 10th. Um, yeah. Now, Laura was that not able to make one of those. Uh, can, can we actually say Wednesdays are good. Okay. Wednesdays okay. are always good all day. Because when I call the county museum, there may not be that many opportunities. opportunities just to well, we can, you know, meet yeah. here, or we can meet at the River Center. I'm sure we could arrange that, too, with okay, uh, Kathleen. Huh? Do you have a fair amount of room? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, how many can they seat? 100. 
Oh, well, maybe we should just do it there anyway. Well, maybe not 100. Um, well, maybe we should just do it there anyway, because that way there, it's bigger anyway. And if we have a lot, we have a lot. Well, let's issues. call, I call Kathleen right now and find out how many chairs they have. Okay. And if they can afford them? For free, and they have free parking? Yeah. Oh, well, maybe we should yeah. do this anyway. Yeah. Okay, well, let me go. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. No, you'll never you'll never recognize them. Okay. Because I put all your stuff up here. <laughs> if, if we don't, if we can't do a match, then then we have to come up with a whole hundred copies. Right. Uh, or make it right after Bring lunch. lunch. Bring lunch. Mm. You like make it one o'clock. Okay, so or one thirty. Yeah, I would do it that way. Okay. Yeah. Grant, I'm just.